the, some of the best music I've heard in another church uh, in, a, in a long, long time. All right, I guess I lied to you last week. I didn't do it on purpose. I thought that was the last church bulletin bloopers, but it's not. I got one more. And uh, let me read some of these to you. These are, again, they're supposed to be actual uh, things that were either said in churches or printed in church bulletins. It says, we have received word of sudden passing of Reverend Smith this morning during the worship service. Now let's stand and sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow. <laughs> bad, bad placement. Uh, Sixpiration. Uh, no, excuse me. Sinspiration. S-I-N-S. Sinspiration this Sunday night at church. Y'all come. I'll come and sin. Uh, this blooper showed up on the main page of the internet uh, website for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. It said, quote, in a show of near anonymity, in other words, nobody knew who said what or did what, the convention approved full uh, communion with the Anglican Church of Canada. I think it meant unanimity, but it said anonymity, something like that. You know the word. <laughs> Say it to yourself. Um, lift, <laughs> this one says, lift up our messianic brothers and sisters in Israel who are suffering during our prayer time. <laughs> Some of this is just bad English. It really is. Gl glory to God, to all and P's, P-E-A-S, to his people on earth. But only frozen, not canned, okay? Canned are terrible. Uh, join us for a skirt present, presented by the drama team. So there's going to be a skirt presented by the drama team. Should be a skit. Uh, we will have... We will have a super bowel party this next Sunday night. We will also have our regular service. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. Uh, summer festival. What, uh, menu for Wednesday night. Half-baked chicken. Baked potato and corn. Half-baked. Half-baked chicken. Mostly raw. Uh, applications are now being accepted for two-year-old nursery workers. <laughs> Don't think I want to drop my kid off at that nursery. Uh, Brother Lamar has, uh, has uh, gone on to be the Lord. I don't think so. I think it means with. The, uh, the, pastor, will <laughs> the pastor will light his candle from the altar candles. The ushers will light their candle from the pastor's candle. Then the ushers will turn and light each worshiper in the first pew. <laughs> well, at least the front will be able to see really well. Um, song lyrics. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and briefs to bear. <laughs> That's talking about legal briefs, okay? You people. Uh, church sign, Jesus saves. Safeway sign across the street. And I don't think this is on purpose. I could just see this happening, okay? Church sign says Jesus saves. Safeway sign across the street says Safeway saves you more. Which is what you would see on a, on a grocery sign. Uh, last one. For the group of, of uh, ladies called Moms Who Care, and pray for the children in school. When their meeting was canceled one week, there will be no moms who care this week. <laughs> and I find that hard to believe because moms I know care. All right, Micah chapter 1. Let's all stand together if you would. And we'll read the first four verses and then get right into it here tonight. It says, The word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morathite, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he, he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, 
the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains shall be molten under him and the valleys shall be cleft as wax before the fire and as the waters that are poured down a steep place. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have tonight to meet together and to study your word, to spend some time in prayer together here in a little bit. Father, it's just good in the middle of the week to come apart and just get a little refreshment, get some encouragement, and be an encouragement one to another. We pray your blessings upon this time together in your word. May you speak to our hearts. Lead us and guide us as we study your truth. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Just some introductory remarks about, about Micah. Uh, Micah was a prophet, and his name means uh, who is like Jehovah, and it's the short version of Micaiah. Uh, he, pr he prophesied in, in the last half of, of the 8th century. He, uh, the, the time of the, the writing of the book covers from about 750 B.C. to 710 B.C., he prophesied during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and, and Hezekiah, and he personally was, a, was also a contemporary uh, of Isaiah, who was in Judah, and then uh, uh, Emma, Amos, excuse me, Amos and Hosea in Israel. Um, he was a, a, a Morassathite. Uh, he lived in Morasheth of Gath, and, and this was a town that was on the pathway that eventually the Assyrians crossed over and ended, up, and ended up going through that town. And as you know, we've talked about this before, the Assyrians were always ruthless. They're just ruthless. And uh, when they went through a town uh, like that, they usually made... Uh, made quite a mess and ended up, ended up killing people and torturing folks when they did. Um, he, his preaching was instrumental uh, in the time uh, of repentance in Judah uh, under King Hezekiah. And you see that in Jeremiah. Take your Bibles, keep your finger here, but go to Jeremiah chapter 26. Yeah, forgive me tonight, my eyes are giving me a little bit of trouble. Jeremiah 26. In Jeremiah 26, look down with me in verses 18 and 19. Jeremiah 26, verses 18 and 19. It says, Micah, the Morassathite, uh, prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and spake to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the, the, of the house as the high places of a forest. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all, uh, in, in all Judah, put him at all to death? Did he not fear the Lord and besought the Lord, and the Lord repented him of the evil which he had pronounced against them? Thus might we procure great evil against our souls. So he was, a, he was a contemporary of Hezekiah and his preaching was part of what prompted uh, Hezekiah to do right and to, and to th there be a, a, uh, a repentance, a, a wave and a time of repentance uh, in, in Judah. Uh, his preaching was uh, threefold in this, in this book. He starts out with God's condemnation of Israel, how, how God said that Israel had sinned, had gone against him, also Judah had. And uh, then secondly, he talks about the judgment that God was going to bring uh, to both Israel and Judah. And then thirdly, uh, God's restoration of Israel. And again, one of the patterns that we're seeing in, in all of the, uh, just about all of the, the minor prophets is that uh, even though there are severe warnings, there is severe judgment coming, God always gives a hope 
of restoration. Always does. Uh, every book that we have that we have studied, even like the book of uh, Jonah, uh, though that that wasn't Israel, that was the Assyrians. Uh, there was no hope given in the message, but there was hope at the end because because the city of Nineveh did repent and uh, and got right with God. God God showed uh, Micah. Uh, the judgment of Israel under Assyria, and the judgment of Judah under Babylon. So he saw uh, both of those judgments and saw and knew what was coming. God used him to call Israel and Judah back to worship uh, of Jehovah God, but they refused. They didn't, they didn't listen. They didn't heed the warning. They did not repent. In, uh, in, in verse one, uh, verses 1 and, and 2, it says, The word of the Lord that came to Micah the, uh, the Morasthite in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw uh, concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear all you people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is, and and uh, let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Now, his message was not just to the Jews, but it was actually to the whole earth. If you look at that first verse again, it says, The word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morasthite uh, in the days of Jotham. Uh, and then you go down to verse 2, and it says, Hear all ye people, hearken, O earth. So this isn't just addressed just to them, although primarily it is to them, but it's really to the whole earth. And, and God speaks to all the people on the earth in a personal way. In other words, if you're not right with God, you need to be. Uh, no matter who you are, whether you're, whether you're Judah, whether you're part of Israel, or you're neither, uh, God is God over all the nations. And he makes that pretty clear just right in the second verse. Uh, God calls himself, in that verse, the Lord God. Uh, when he calls himself the Lord God, it means that he is obviously the supreme authority uh, over all. And again, not just Israel and not just Judah, but over the whole earth. And what he does to his people uh, affects the whole world. One of the things that I saw that I'd never seen before, and I'd re read the book of Micah many, many times, and I realized that in, that in those first two verses, he's addressing Israel and Judah. But he's also addressing the whole world. And the connection there is that whatever God does with Israel, and this has really always been the case, whatever God does with Israel will eventually affect the whole world. It's not just Israel. It'll also affect the rest of the world. There's going to be a day when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back to this earth and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. He's going to do it from Israel. He's going to do it from, from, uh, from Jerusalem, from the throne of David. And uh, yet it's going to obviously uh, affect the whole earth. When you go to the Old Testament and you look at the verses that have to do with the coming kingdom, with the thousand-year reign. Uh, they're, they're addressed to Israel. Uh, you find them in Isaiah. You find verses in, in uh, Psalms. You find verses in Ezekiel. You find verses in Jeremiah. And, uh, and again, these are all, in fact, every uh, book where there has been uh, a promise and a hope of restoration of Israel it's, it's been of Israel, but that's going to affect not just Israel, but it's going to affect the rest of the world uh, as it is. And, and you think about it, you know, what God does with his people today, meaning, meaning us, the church, the body of Christ, uh, what he does uh, with, with Christians affects the earth. And there is a big event coming that's going to greatly affect the earth. Have you ever just, you know, thought much about when, uh, when the blessed hope takes place and Jesus Christ comes back for his own, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, and I'm sure hoping it's, I'm going to be alive and remaining, uh, 
uh, will be caught up together with him in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, comfort one another with these words. That's great for us, but can you imagine what's going to happen on this earth? And for lots of reasons. Uh, number one, any, any kind of human gospel witness is gone. They're gone. Uh, no, it just, just you know, it, it boggles my mind. that At that moment, there will be no ambassadors for Jesus Christ on the earth. None. So that's going to affect things. Obviously, depending upon what those people were doing at the time that they, were take, that they will be taken up, uh, it's going to affect things. Uh, I've, I've read several books that are fictional, fictional books based on a real event that's going to take place some, someday, the rapture. And, and uh, in, in those books, they, they suppose, you know, you're gonna, you might have a, an airplane pilot. He's gone. What happens to the airplane? You got somebody driving a car. They're going down the street. All of a sudden, the driver's taken out. Uh, I've actually seen bumper stickers that say, uh, you know, uh, warning, uh, if the rapture takes place, <laughs> the driver will be absent from this car in, in a twinkling of an eye. Uh, that's, that really is all true. But then the other thing that I thought about, which I think is, is the most probably devastating thing, is that all of the salt and all of the light, which Jesus Christ said that that's what we are, right? We're salt and light. The salt and the light of the world is gone. It's going to be the first time, uh, you know, it, it, since, since the cross, it's going to be the first time, I'm saying that, uh, maybe, maybe the first time ever, I guess, uh, except for maybe in the garden. But it would be the first time when there, when there is no salt and light on the earth. Uh, Jesus said, we are the salt of the, of the world. We are the, we're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. And all of that will be taken out at, at one moment. And so when God does something with his people, with the blessed hope, it's going to affect the whole world. And, and uh, when the Lord is speaking in verse, verse 2, it says on the end of the verse, it says, and let the, the Lord God be witness against you the Lord from his holy temple. Um, when he, God proclaims judgment, it's personal. And it's not only uh, aimed at Judah and aimed at Israel, but it's also aimed at the individuals that had turned their back on him. Obviously, though Micah would be caught up in the corporate judgment because he's there, uh, God did not have an issue with Micah because Micah was right with God. There, God always has a remnant of people that have their hearts right toward him. But understand this, that even with that remnant, they may have to go through the difficulties that the rest of the nation is going through because they're there. You look at the life of Jeremiah, he had a tough life. You know, he's thrown into slime pits and, and uh, he was, he was uh, jailed and and uh, he was mistreated. Well, that was all because of where Israel was at the time spiritually. Now, was he right with God? Absolutely. And he was, he was right smack dab in the middle of God's will doing what God wanted him to do. But this, this, this says something at the, at the end of the verse about God speaking from his holy temple. That is, that is God's nature. That is who God is. He is holy. Uh, the reason why the temple's holy is because that's the place where, where God was. And that is his character. And because of his character, he could not put up with the sin and judgment had to come. Look down in verse 5. It says, For the transgression of Jacob is all this, and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem. The chief sin that uh, Israel and Judah committed that, that he singles out in this book is the sin of idolatry. 
Take your Bibles and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah 2. Isaiah chapter 2. Look with me in verses 17 through 21. Isaiah 2 and verse 17. It says, And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. God absolutely despises and hates any form of idolatry. It says, and they, and they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the, of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. God absolutely hates idolatry. And they, they, what they had done is they at one time were serving him, were worshiping him, were exalting him. They on purpose, by, by design and by, by decision, turned their back on a, a God who had blessed them over and over again, who had called them his people, they turned their back on him and they began to serve idols. Now, when I say idols, I mean they had statues and they would, they would car carve them out of stone, they'd carve them out of wood, and they would worship them. You know the story about uh, Moses going up to Mount Sinai when he came down they were worshiping a golden calf. They had fashioned that calf, okay? The people came and, and brought uh, various uh, gold in various forms, and Aaron melted it down, fashioned the calf, and said, this is what brought you out of Egypt. I mean, what a, what a slap in the face to God, you know? And, uh, that, that, uh, that, that idol did absolutely nothing for them. Uh, but they, they, they went ahead and they reverted back to that, that kind of worship. And that's idolatry. Now, we don't have a problem with that per se uh, in, in the respect of, uh, you know, I, I can't tell you the last time I saw somebody, at least in America, I know in, in some other countries they, they still do it. And I, I'm sure in America there's some that goes on too. But it's just not... It's not uh, normal to see folks getting down in front of a statue and kissing its feet. I realize they do that in Catholicism, uh, but uh, I don't think that's normal either. Uh, but the, the point is, is that that's not the only form of idolatry. What, if you were to boil it all down and just give a, a simple definition, what essentially is idolatry? Help me out. Give me some ideas. What is idolatry? If somebody is guilty of idolatry, do they have to be bowing down to a statue? No. Yes? Okay. Covetousness is idolatry. How is covetousness, how is covetousness Dave, idolatry? Yeah, it, what, it, what it really is, is that, and, and you basically just said it, it's a, like a controlling factor. It's the thing that controls us. Uh, it takes priority. When, uh, when covetous gets a hold of you, you put God on the back burner and you go after that thing, okay? Uh, but is, is that all it is? Is it just covetousness? Generally speaking, what is just a... 
a general, that's an example of one. But generally speaking, what is idolatry? Yes? Worshiping anything that's not God. Okay, worshiping or putting in the first position anything that's not God. Take your Bibles, keep your finger in Micah, and go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. In reality, idolatry is simply violating uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. This is what God told Israel, and this commandment is reiterated in the New Testament. Jesus Christ called it the great commandment. And it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Anytime you take that love, anytime you take that attention, and you put it on something or someone else, immediately it, that becomes idolatry. And in the case particularly of covetousness, which the Bible says covetousness is idolatry, what has happened is you've taken your desires and you've put that on whatever it is, either a person or a thing, that you covet. Uh, your heart has been directed toward that instead of being directed first and foremost toward God. And, you know, I, one of the things I think we have to keep in mind is that it's possible to be an idolater and still think you love God. Here's the problem. You may still love God, but the love isn't as great as the love that's superseding your love for God. And so your love is, is misplaced and it's, it's, it's a wrong kind of love. God never wants to take second place. And that's why he said he hated idolatry because they weren't giving him the honor and they weren't giving him the glory that he so richly deserved. I, I, idolatry is just simply uh, the violation of loving God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and all of our might. It's turning to something or turning to someone other than God and, and that thing or person uh, getting, a, uh, getting a position in our, in our life that only God is supposed to hold. Give me some examples, modern day examples, of how we can take something, and by the way, it's often, uh, it's often taking something that's good and turning it into an idol. As an example, with the, with the golden calf, was the gold in and of itself evil? Well, of course not, no it wasn't. But as soon as that gold was formed and became an idol and they worshiped it, and they put their affection toward it, then it became evil. How can we take something that, give me examples of things that are, I know it's snowing out there, but it doesn't have to be snowing in your brain tonight, okay? <laughs> so uh, give me some examples tonight. Of, I, I don't want to do this all by myself. I feel like a, a one, man, one man show up here. Yeah. Yes, sir, Titus. Say that again? Okay, you give up worshiping God for doing something else, like? Okay, going to a ball game, uh, playing sports, um, letting, letting even, you know, uh, letting family, letting work, letting anything dominate over that relationship. Okay, good. Excellent. What else? Yeah, Michael. Uh, personal struggle would be in my thoughts. So, like, if the Word of God says something, but I don't totally understand it, or I don't totally feel it, taking those thoughts into captivity and, like, in the name of Jesus, rebuking them, bringing them into, you know, submission. So, if I'm willing to go along with my own feelings or my own emotions or my own thoughts on something, rather than responding the way the Word of God does, it's idolatry because it's self, right? Yes, yes, ma'am. 
Uh, what does the Bible say? The just shall live by feelings, right? No. <laughs> it says the just shall live by faith. If I live by feeling instead of living by faith, then I'm guilty of idolatry. And, and honestly, by the time it's all done, you know who the idol is? Me. Me. Uh, whenever we know that God wants us to do something and we've got a better idea or we just don't want to do it, then we become the idol because we're serving ourselves instead of first serving God. Good, good. Any others? Yes, sir, Michael. Neglecting your prayer and reading. Okay, four, give me something good. Watching uh, a video or listening to something else that's not your reading or prayer. Okay, it, it could, could it be a, a something that would be normally in and of itself a good thing? Normally, and in and of itself. Yeah, it can, but if it's taking the place of prayer and spending time in the Word of God, in other words, our relationship with God is put off to the side and we're doing the entertainment. There's nothing wrong with, with entertainment as long as it's the right kind. There's nothing wrong with enjoying it. Is, is it. is it wrong to run out and shoot hoops out in the, out in the, out in the driveway? Uh, no, it's not. But if you're supposed to be reading your Bible and praying, then all of a sudden, that takes the, the place of where God ought to belong. And now a good thing has now become an idolatrous thing rather than a good thing. Uh, go with me back to Micah chapter 1. Look at verses 6 through 9. Verse 6 says, Therefore I, I will make Samaria as a heap of the field and as plantings of a vineyard, and I will pour down the, uh, the stones thereof into the valley, and I will discover the foundations thereof, and all the graven images thereof shall be beaten to pieces, and all the hires thereof shall be burned with a fire, and all the idols thereof will I lay desolate. For she gathered it of the hire of an harlot, and they shall return to the hire of an harlot. Therefore, I will wail and howl. I will go stripped and naked. I will make a wailing like the dragons and mourning as the owls. For, for her wound is incurable. For it is come unto Judah. He is come unto the, unto the gate of, of my people, even to Jerusalem. Uh, in those verses, uh, God warns. Of, of the coming ruin of Samaria. And, and particularly, uh, Samaria was the, the capital city of, of the northern kingdom of Israel. And Samaria was a wealthy city. It was a beautiful city. But it had become a city with people that had turned to idolatry. And in verse 7, uh, God says that he would have all idols destroyed. He was going to have all the idols destroyed. And those things that were built by the income that came in from idolatry. And that's what he's referring to when he says the hire of an harlot. She, uh, Israel became a harlot because she turned her heart away from God and, and to false, false gods and false idols. Down in verse 8. He talks about uh, destitution and sorrow would result and the fact that he would be very, very sorrowful. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know any Christian that's worth their salt that knows the direction that America is going, uh, that would, will not, is not already uh, very, very sorrowful over the direction that we're taking. And we know what's coming down the pipe. Just like what happened uh, with Israel and with Judah, uh, d judgment was coming, and they were warned over and over and over again about that judgment. I believe, I believe that if, if we don't, as a nation, if there isn't a stirring, if there isn't a turning, uh, we're, in, we're in some real trouble. Uh, you, know, you can't kill as many babies as we kill every year. 
and not end up. Uh, and that's just one thing. Uh, now there's so much that's going on. And, and I've told you before, I've, I don't think in my lifetime I've ever seen the rapidity and the speed of evil taking over uh, like, like I have seen. Now, again, you know, uh, the darker the night, the brighter the light shines. I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, just put you into a, into a, a black f uh, funk tonight. But the point is, is that uh, when you're going down that road, you're going to see that thing coming. And those that are trying to do right, and Micah did. He was, he was right before God and he was used of God. God told him to give a message. He gave the message. He didn't, he didn't water it down. He didn't cut it down at all. And uh, when, when, he, when he did so, he says, he's, he's talking about the fact that he's, he's going to greatly mourn because of the, the problems and the destitution and the sorrow and the destruction that both Israel and Judah is going to experience. And to me, one of, one of the most one of the saddest phrases in that whole chapter, in fact, the saddest phrase in that whole chapter is in the end of verse 9. Uh, where, where it says, uh, it says, uh, I'm sorry, the beginning of verse nine says, for her wound is incurable. In other words, this is a dead end street. This is it. The judgment is definitely coming. Now we go down to verses 10 through 16. And in verse 10, it says, declare ye it not at Gath. Weep ye not at all. In, the, in the, the house of Aphra, uh, roll thyself in the dust. What's, what's he saying? Well, this is a, this is a very similar uh, phrase that what, uh, what, what David gave when uh, Saul and Jonathan, when Saul and Jonathan died in battle. He said, weep not. In other words, don't let the, don't let the enemy see your tears. Uh, because all that would do was cause the enemies to rejoice, and not not just because of a not because the, uh, they didn't want to be ashamed, but God would be defamed because of that thing. And so he's saying, you know, don't don't show uh, to to others what what is going on uh, because of the results of your sin. Verse eleven. Uh, pass, pass ye away, thou inhabitant of Sapphir, uh, having thy, thy shame naked, the inhabitant of Zion, uh, Zionen, uh, came not forth in the, in the morning of, of uh, Beth, boy, my eyes are shot. Uh, I can't even find out. Beth, Beth Ezel, uh, he shall receive of you his standing. And um, Zayan Nain um, would hide in fear and would hide in shame uh, around normal activities. And, and uh, going in between cities was, was stopped. Uh, all, that, all that kind of uh, uh, intercommerce and so forth uh, was stopped because of what was happening in Israel, in verse 12, it says, For the inhabitant of Marath uh, waited carefully for good, but evil came down from the Lord unto the gate uh, of Jerusalem. Um, Marath waited uh, for good, but didn't get any good. All it got was evil. It expected to get good. And, you know, I, I read this, and I read this again, and I read, read that passage again, I got to thinking, you know, I've, I've seen that kind of attitude with saved people today. You know, they, 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 you know, we do this sometimes. We sin, we do wrong, we know we've done wrong, and we're not repentant of it. But we still expect God to bless. Guess what? God doesn't bless when we're not doing right. God blesses when we're doing right, when our relationship is right, and when there is an attitude of repentance. And if there isn't, then don't expect the blessings of God. And that just shows you how contrary they were with God. They were, they were, they were just totally off because they, they anticipated to still get blessings, but they, 
they were not in a place where they could be get the blessings of God. Down in verses 14 and 15, it says, Therefore shalt thou give presents to, to Morasheth, Gath, the houses of Aksib shall be a lie to the kings of Israel. Yet will I bring an heir unto thee, O inhabitant of, of uh, Merashah. He shall come unto Adullam, the glory of Israel. Make thee bald and pull thee for thy, uh, for, for thy delicate children. Enlarge thy baldness as the eagle, for they are gone in captivity from thee. Um, those, um, in verse 13, uh, Lachish is, the, is the, the beginning of the sin. Uh, this is evidently where the idolatry really had its roots and started. And I uh, said, listen, attach yourself to a swift beast and, and flee because judgment is coming. In verses 14 and 15, uh, these cities, the uh, Mora, Mora uh, Shethgath, uh, Aksib, uh, Merashah, and Adullam, uh, they were towns of Judah. And all of them eventually were conquered by the Assyrians. That was the, that was the fulfillment of that judgment. And then in verse 16, Israel's told to, to make herself bald. That has to do with uh, just being ashamed. That has to do with mourning because of sin. And the, the sad thing about this whole chapter, none of this had to happen. It wasn't necessary for any of this to happen had they just listened. Again, we just, we just got done last week uh, studying the book of Jonah. And there is a, a city that uh, they, were, they were part of the Assyrian nation. They were horrible people, rotten people. And yet, when they heard about the judgment, they, they, they instantly repented. I, I still, every time I, I think about it, I read about it, I just absolutely marvel at, the, at what happened in that city. Judah and Israel could have done the same thing. When they, when they heard the word of the Lord, if they just repented, God would have reversed that whole thing. But he didn't, because they didn't. They didn't listen. And once again, they were heading for judgment. All right, any questions, comments, thoughts on chapter one, the book of Micah? All right, get out your prayer list, if you would. And I've got a prayer request that I want you to add to your list. And what we're going to do tonight, we're going to ask you to find yourself a prayer partner, split up and to turn this into our prayer closet and uh, spend some time in prayer. I want you particularly to spend some time and pray for the Breyer family. Um, Carlton Breyer went up to the hospital here in Auburn a week ago Monday. From there, he got transferred uh, up to Rochester General. And uh, I saw him in Auburn. I saw him up at Rochester General on Friday. And on Friday, they, they uh, had come to the conclusion that he was having some kind of internal bleeding. And so they had to, first of all, they had to give him a transfusion. Secondly, uh, they had to uh, run some scans. They, ran, they, they uh, ran the scans while we were there. In fact, uh, we left shortly after they took him. But... Uh, they, uh, when, when they got the results of the scans and so forth, they have come to the conclusion that the cancer has spread, that uh, it is continuing to spread. And right now, they are saying that he is not treatable for the cancer. So uh, they have they've given him up to about six months. And uh, so you need to pray. It's, it's knocking the, and rightfully so. It would me, uh, knocking the family for a loop. And Russ is up here. Scott, I think, is Scott still here? Okay. Both, both of them are here. And uh, uh, Russ's wife, Jackie, is here as well. And um, he's still up at Rochester General, correct? Am I right on that? 
okay? And um, they need to dismiss him to some sort of a rehab place. Uh, what Donna would really like to see, Mrs. Breyer would like to see, is uh, him obviously come someplace close to home. And uh, uh, the, the place you'd like to see him go is to Finger Lake Center for Living that's attached to the hospital. Would you please pray about that? Just ask God to do that. Um, that, would, that would help in a lot of ways. Uh, Renee, one of their daughters, is, uh, works there at the hospital, would be able to you know, keep tabs on dad and so forth. Uh, it would just be a real good fit. So pray for that, if you would. Um, I, I, know that's, I know that's Mrs. Breyer's uh, first desire, is to see, that, to see that take place. So if you could pray for that, that would be greatly appreciated. Did I, did I leave anything out, uh, Grant, or we all set? Was there anything else that... Um, that's, that's pretty much it. So be in prayer. Uh, he's been struggling for a, for a long time. And um, uh, he's uh, gone through some really, really rough uh, cancer treatments. And, and honestly, there are times, and I've seen this before, where the treatment is actually uh, more damaging and more hurtful than the disease itself. And that's about where they're at. So what he's going to be on after this is he's going to be on what they call comfort care. Uh, until he goes home to be with the Lord. So be in prayer for the Breyer family, if you would, and pray particularly for Mr. Breyer and Mrs. Breyer. Any other um, prayer requests? Yes, Carol. Did you say a question? Have you heard anything more on Brother Baker? Uh, yes, he is, my understanding is he's home, correct? He got home, I believe, last Thursday. Thursday. And uh, am I right on that? I know you guys have, your mom has kept some uh, contact with him. And, uh, but he definitely needs continued prayer. Um, he is still thinking that uh, he's got a, a meeting scheduled and he just needs to get out of where he's at so he can go to the meeting. Well, basically, his mind is where it was before the whole stroke and everything took place. That's not where he is. Um, his whole thought process is, not, is still not right. Um, when, uh, when he had that stroke, it affected him, and I think also the operation affected him. So... Uh, so just continue to be in prayer for him. I don't, I don't have much more detailed information than that as far as his health goes. Yes, ma'am. Jackie. I have a friend named Kaylee who is starting to go through a separation. She has really small children, and she's not saved. She's actually thinking of coming here with her family for Easter. Good. So prayers for her just in general are awesome. She's really having a hard time. She needs a good group of people. How do you spell that first name? K-A-Y-L-I-E. K-A-Y-L-I-E? K-A-Y-L-I-E. K-A-Y-L-I-E. Okay, and pray for Kaylee. Family difficulties and needs to be saved. Yes. Okay. Thank you so Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, pray for Jerry. He, uh, you heard his back. Oh, I heard, I heard about that when I was down at the conference. He's, I think it's getting better for him, but, you know, it takes a while. Do you know anything about that? Back problem? No. <laughs> Surely I just... Pray for Jerry with his back. He threw it out what Monday, wasn't it? I believe it was. Yeah, and I, th I think he threw it out at work. I believe it was. Yeah. So he was supposed to be at the, at the uh, pastor's meeting, but uh, he ended up not coming because his back was so bad. 
So uh, pray for him. All right, find yourself a partner and, uh, or two, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. This is our prayer closet. You can go out there and you can fellowship, or you can go out in the parking lot and fellowship if you'd like later on. <laughs> I don't think you'll be doing too much of that.